Hey everyone, welcome to our worship time. Let's begin by blessing the name of the Lord through singing.
You would please open your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. We're going to read verses 13 through 31. Keep your hand here, this will be our text. And as we read it, I will remind you that this is the Word of God. The book of Acts, the fourth chapter, we'll begin our reading in verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. 
for the man was more than forty years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Let's pray. Now, Lord, this is a very um, exciting passage. So there's a lot of thrills here. There's a lot of uh, intrigue here. God, there's a lot of danger here. Um, they had performed, uh, they'd seen a great miracle performed. And Peter and John um, was, was arrest, were arrested and, and called in to give an account. And they... They, they, they brashly and boldly said, um, you decide if we should obey you or God, but for us, we have to obey God. So Lord, I think there's some lessons here for uh, believers, believers throughout uh, time and, and place. Um, I think the history of the church has been filled of stories, filled with stories like this. Of believers called in and questioned and threatened and told to no longer bear the name of Jesus yet who who have gone out and, and proclaimed salvation through Christ uh, regardless so Lord speak to us and through this passage I pray amen well I don't know when you're watching this but let me uh, wish you a Happy 4th of July. The title of my message is When the 4th of July is Over. I thought it'd be appropriate because of J July 4th and the celebration of the signing of the Declaration of Independence to read a little bit of the Declaration of Independence. The Unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America. Within the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Notice the phrase, nature's God. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to this separation. It goes on to say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, um, you have mentioned here in the Declaration, nature's God, now which is, I, I admit, somewhat generic, uh, but it's a little more specific when it goes to um, calling uh, this God uh, our creator, that all men are created by nature's God. So this is uh, a specific title for a God, and that is he is our creator. And because he is our creator, we have certain rights that come from him and not from 
uh, the powers that be. This was also recognized in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment of the Constitution, which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, again, I would reiterate the phrase, uh, no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So here are freedoms granted by the Constitution, which finds its source, of course, in uh, this belief that there is a creator God who gives us uh, the rights. I will mention that at the end of the First Amendment, it says, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. This is, of course, the, the right to protest, to um, a, a, a petition the government for a redress of grievances. It's very American to protest. In fact, the, the, the freedom to protest is one of the things that makes America great and, and makes America unique. Uh, uh, we've seen in recent times what happens when people protest in China or protest in Taiwan or protest in Hong Kong. Um, it's very American to protest. I have participated in, in, in protests. I do think, however, that it says here peaceably protest or peaceably assemble. It doesn't give a right uh, to, for violence uh, or the right to commit crimes while protesting, but certainly it is, is, it is a good thing to be able to protest and bring up uh, when the people have a complaint against uh, the authorities and against government and against unjust laws and treatments and so on. I'd also like to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, that of course does not go back to the Founding Fathers. It does not go back to 1776 or um, 1786 or 84, whenever the Constitution was ratified. Um, in fact, uh, the phrase under God wasn't added until 1954, um, but it was added, One Nation Under God. I'm proud to be an American. I'm as American as apple pie. Uh, I fly the flag. I stand for the national anthem. I believe this is the greatest country on earth. I am humbled by the thought of those who died in other countries fighting for other people's freedom. We defeated Nazism, fascism, communism. I celebrate the 4th of July. But what about when the 4th is over? When we find ourselves in a country that no longer respects religion, which denies that there is God, the creator. But what then? What then? When these freedoms that we have enjoyed for over uh, 250 years, when they no longer are uh, enforced and um, in place, what then? Well, then we Christians and our churches will be just like every other Christian everywhere just like every Christian since the day of Pentecost. Why should we expect to be any different? Did not Jesus say that we are to expect persecution? Now, let me quickly say, I have never been persecuted for my faith and no church I've ever been a part of has been persecuted for the faith. Even during the recent pandemic, I appreciated that our governor never once singled out churches for restrictions of any kind. Although it does happen occasionally, uh, not many believers in the United States can claim to have been persecuted for their Christian faith. But for how long can we say that? I don't know. 
I know I'd rather be prepared and not need it than not to be prepared when it comes. So my title is When the Fourth of July is Over, and my subtitle is Preparing for Persecution. I think we believers and churches should be prepared for persecution. And I think we see some very valuable lessons in our passage. First of all, persecution reveals the blindness of man's heart. Persecution reveals man's blindness. Persecution reveals man's blindness. Now you go back to uh, Acts chapter 4, um, verse 16. What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They denied what they called undeniable. Do you see that? They couldn't deny what happened, and you can read about that in, in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, that the lame man was healed at the temple um, in a very public uh, setting. They couldn't deny that it happened, but they denied it anyway. Um, this demonstrates the blindness of, of people, of the, of, of the lost. Second Corinthians 4, 4 says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. Um, we, sh we should understand that. We, sh we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be shocked by that. Um, what seems obvious to us as believers what seems obvious to us is not obvious to them. They, they are blind to the truth, and we shouldn't expect any differently. We should pray that their eyes be open, that the, their eyes and their understanding be open. We should pray that, that uh, they would escape the, the delusion of Satan. Uh, but nevertheless, we shouldn't be surprised that um, by their blindness. Since people are spiritually blind, they think the dark is normal. Since people are spiritually blind, they think the dark is normal. So, we, you know, it, it frustrates us. We, we want to, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, sometimes I just want to scream and, and, and grab somebody and shake them and say, don't you see this? Don't you, don't you see that you're believing a lie? Don't you believe, uh, don't you see that, that uh, there's an inherent contradiction in, in, in your worldview um, don't you see how you're trying to hold on to two opposing truths at the same time? Um, why can't you see this? Well, they can't see it because they're spiritually blind. Because they're spiritually blind, um, they want to persecute those who see things differently. Persecution reveals man's blindness. We shouldn't be surprised that uh, they live in darkness. Secondly, persecution forces you to hope in heaven. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. Again, they were acknowledging that, that uh, there was more to their existence than uh, this particular uh, life like Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Uh, the apostles put their hope in something more than just survival, something more than just uh, uh, preserving their life. Matthew, Matthew 16, 26. For what... Will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew ten twenty eight. Do not fear those who kill the body, 
but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Christians believe that the powers of this world are limited to this life only, but that uh, God's power exists for eternity. That there's more things important than just saving our lives. And that is the fact that Jesus saves our souls. The early church realized that the world's kingdom is not all there is. Again, they, they pray in verse 25, they, they quoted uh, the psalmist David. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and their rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Um, that's what we should expect them to do. Um, they do not understand um, uh, the gospel. They do not understand that we have a hope that, that is, is, is higher than um, this life only. That um, we believe that... Uh, the most important thing is uh, our soul, uh, not our life. So persecution forces you to hope in heaven. Persecution reveals man's blindness. Thirdly, persecution makes you appreciate the church. Makes you appreciate the church. So what did they do? They they were arrested. They were um, questioned. They were jailed. Um, and they were released. What did they do? They immediately went to the church. And when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders said to them. You go down to verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were one heart and one soul. They, they, they immediately went to church. They went to where there was a congregation where the church was gathered. They reported to the church. There is no concept of the church ever functioning without meeting together. Um, as I've said and will continue to say, um, with the uncertain future about uh, COVID-19 and, and what type of restrictions will be uh, enforced and how it will impact the church, we're glad that I'm glad that you can watch me right now on, on video, but it's not church. Church is when believers gather together and find strength and, and comfort together. So what did they, how did they respond to persecution? They immediately sought the strengthening, comforting, encouraging presence of God's people as they congregated. Um, Persecution reminds us that we need encouragement when times are hard. When things are good, uh, you know, church seems to be an option to many people. When things are good, you go to church when you don't have something else to do. Um, when things are good, you go to church unless you want to go to the beach or you want to go to the cabin or you want to go to a sporting event or you want to go to a tournament. Um, but I guarantee you when, when persecution comes about, um, you want to go to church. Persecution makes you appreciate the church. Fourthly, persecution teaches you to pray better. Verses 24 through 30 is a prayer. It's a prayer. They, um, they uh, lifted their voices to God in one accord. And they spent most of the, the prayer praising God. For who he is but then he, in verse 29 and now lord take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence they didn't ask god they didn't ask for god to remove the threat but to increase their courage right they didn't ask god to remove the threat they didn't even ask god necessarily to keep them safe what they asked god for was courage to face persecution because they knew, as Jesus had taught, in this world you will face persecution. This has been, this was true for the early church. It has been true for the church all through the 2,000 years of Christian history. Um, it's been true for individual Christians throughout the last 2,000 years. And we shouldn't be surprised if it, if it comes true for us, for our churches, 
in our lives. They didn't ask God to remove the threat, but to increase their courage. I also like to mention the right prayer leads to right answers. The right prayers leads to right answers. Because they asked for courage, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. They prayed for boldness. They got boldness. They, they prayed for courage. God answered the prayer and gave them courage. The right prayer leads to the right answers. Number five, persecution pushes you to trust in God's sovereignty. Persecution pushes you to trust in God's sovereignty. Verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. In other words, they were saying, none of this uh, took you by surprise, God. Particularly verse 27, that your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel, uh, all crucified according to your plan. They trusted in God's sovereignty. The same God who gave us our freedoms is the same God who allows them to cease. The same God who gave us our freedoms will be the same God if he chooses that allows them to cease. We must pray that God opens the eyes of those who would do us harm. They're blind, as Pontius Pilate and Herod and the Gentiles and the nation of Israel was blind to God's anointed servant, the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus. They needed a supernatural awakening. They needed a supernatural work of the Spirit. Can I give you one last passage? Go to Hebrews 11. We love Hebrews 11. It's the roll call, roll call of the faith. It's the heroes of the faith. And they we're, we're awed by the things that uh, they uh, accomplished through faith. But look at verse 36. And others, there were others here in, in Hebrews 11. In fact, you could say, you know, you know it starts with uh, Abel and goes through um, kind of a, a, a history of the Old Testament. But now we're moving into uh, uh, more New Testament times, okay? Um, and others experienced mockings. And scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were so they were sawn uh, in two, sawed in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the grounds. There's the history of the early church. What will our history be? I do not know. Do I pray often? Uh, even so, come Lord Jesus. Absolutely. As a grandparent, um, I'm very concerned about what my grandkids are going to face and what kind of country they're going to grow up in. Um, and the difficulty it may be to be to be a Christian. Would I like Christ to come before uh, we experience what the rest of Christianity has experienced? I'd like that. I don't know that. So I pray for courage. I pray for courage for my kids, for my grandkids, for my church. For you when you face persecution at work because you don't buy into the party line when you won't sign on to the group think uh, when maybe you're not allowed to attend a certain college because of your Christian belief or you're denied a certain vocation because of your Christian belief I pray for you to have courage I pray for our church to have courage when we become increasingly unpop unpopular in, in what we uh, espouse what we believe Let's pray. Father, we pray for courage. 
give us courage. Help us to teach and proclaim the name of Jesus. Help us to stick by the truth. We, we serve the one who claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. We, 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 we believe a book that our founder, Jesus Christ, said uh, that uh, God's word is truth. Thy word is truth. Lord, we, we, we believe in an objective truth. And even though the world constantly changes its mind, um, we want boldness to proclaim the truth and the life-saving message of Jesus Christ, Lord, not to be obnoxious and beat people over the head with the Bible, but to proclaim the truth that Jesus saves. And yes, people were blind, but God can open their eyes to the truth, to the reality, the gospel, to the glory of Christ. Lord, help us to be bold in that, I pray. Amen. And Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, 